Hi, everybody. Um, again, my name is Taylor Faison, and for this presentation, I'm going to be discussing um, how to design a truly end-to-end -end airflow project. Now, two quick things about this presentation. One, this is based on a project that I did this time last year, or around this time last year, um, when at first I had no idea what airflow was, <laughs> how to do it, how to use it, what was involved in it. Um, so if you are new to airflow um, or trying to figure out like its use case, um, this is totally fine for you. Secondly, I have some code snippets um, sprinkled throughout um, the slides. So if you see a QR code, just be ready to snap that and you'll see exactly kind of the code um, where I've written it. So let's get started. Um, so let's imagine it's late Wednesday afternoon. You finished all your meetings, you kind of done your tasks for the day, um, and you're just about to like pack up and get ready to go home. But right before you get ready to go, you get this message from Kevin in accounting. So Kevin says, hey, do we have any data on Stripe rev revenue recognition? Um, we already pull in other data from Stripe, so this data should be pretty simple, right? Um, don't raise your hand, but I'm sure many of you have gotten a request that should be pretty simple. Um, and I know what you want to say, uh, so I'll say it for you. Yeah, I'm just going to select star from a table that's super perfect, doesn't exist. Um, but before you actually send that, um, you actually just send this nice message that says, it might be possible, um, but what exactly do you need? And so Kevin comes back and says, we need to access Stripe's revenue recognition data so that the accounting team can do their month and close. Throughout the month, we'll review the data on an ad hoc basis, um, and hopefully we're able to catch any like pressing issues um, before they've kind of gone on for too long. Um, revenue is very top of mind for the accounting team, especially like higher up. And so um, during their Monday stand-ups, they're gonna want to review that data just to kind of spur conversation and figure out what they need to do next. So this sounds pretty reasonable. You're probably thinking to yourself, okay, I can probably use this handy dandy tool called Airflow to help with this. Um, but before you get ready to ask Kevin for more questions, he goes, by the way, I'm out for PTO. Um, I will see you on Monday. Um, thanks, Kevin. Uh, so um, before you freak out and, you know, go just crazy because you can't ask Kevin all the questions you need to ask him, you kind of go back to that last message where he said that they need to access Stripe revenue recognition data. Um, they're going to review it throughout the month. Um, they want to catch issues before they kind of go on for too long, and that revenue is very top of mind, and they're going to review it weekly. And already from this, you can kind of see that each sentence corresponds to um, a task, a task group, an action that you can perform in Airflow. And so we're just going to start with this. We're going to go with this and figure out how can we build an MVP um, Airflow project to solve this use case. And of course, as anybody here who's ever worked on a data product before, whatever you build at first is not what you use in the end. So it's totally fine if this isn't perfect, but you just want to kind of put something together that solves the pressing issue. So first, let's start with the first sentence that he said. So he said that we need to access revenue recognition data. Um, and you remember that we're already bringing in Stripe data from, let's say, Fivetran or Stitch or some other type of data ETL tool. But Stripe doesn't allow you to sync revenue recognition data through those tools. You kind of have to do it yourself, um, just fetching from their API. So this is where Airflow shines. Um, so first, we're going to fetch the data using some simple operators. Then we're going to store the raw data um, into Google Cloud Storage so that we can kind of keep it and let it be persistent. And then lastly, we're going to transfer that data over to um, BigQuery. And so here's kind of overall kind of how that workflow looks. So first, um, and this is very like uh, pointed towards Stripe, but you can think about any other API. There might be some kind of complex or just like workflow logic to get that data. That also applies here as well. But first, we're going to tell Stripe, hey, here's the report that we want. When was the last time it was updated? Stripe responds and says if it was updated recently, and we can kind of use the DAG logical date to figure out should we update it, um, should we sync this data now. Um, if it has been updated recently, we're going to create the report, um, and then we're going to wait for Stripe to actually finish it. Um, and then once it's finished, we're going to head over to the very next task group. There's more advanced ways or probably um, cleaner ways to do this, right? Instead of polling the Stripe API, you might want to set up a webhook and some other, you know, uh, features as well that's kind of already embedded into Airflow. However, we just want to get something up and running because Kevin only gave us two days to get this project going, but same thing applies for however you want to solve this problem. And so what that looks like is first, um, actually, let me go back 
real quick. So I'm actually going to show if it will show. There we go. So here's kind of overall how that extraction process looks. Um, the cool thing, um, especially while I was learning Airflow, um, one of the topics that kind of really stuck with me was the whole concept of XCOM and sharing data between just different tasks. That's exactly what I'm doing here. I'm using kind of the basic operators and just asking um, Stripe for certain data. It's stored in XCOM and just kind of pulling that and using that as needed. So first, I create the recognition report. I check to see when it was last updated, and I use the um, I use kind of the logical date from the DAG run to figure out if I should sync from there. Um, I use a short circuit operator, and so if true has been updated, keep going. Um, from there, I create the uh, the run, and then afterwards, I kind of wait to see if you know things are done, um, and then that kind of is the end of the extraction process. And after I extract the data, I then load it into um, Google Cloud Platform. And so we're using two uh, components here. One is Google Cloud Storage, just to kind of take that CSV, dump it in, um, and just hold it. Uh, and then from there, we take that CSV and we transfer it to BigQuery. Um, you're probably wondering, why don't I just send it straight to BigQuery? Um, sometimes this data can be very, very large. In my case, when I did this in real life, there were tens of thousands of rows, um, which I you know, don't want to put into XCOM for various reasons. Um, and also, too, uh, you want to be able to rerun this over and over again without having to refetch the Stripe data. So this is kind of the best way for me to kind of store it first, um, be able to analyze it very easily if I need to, um, and then also transfer it over to uh, the data warehouse. So once everything is in there, the end result is that you have data in your data warehouse, and it's located in what's shown here. Sorry, this is a very light blue. Um, is The data is found in Airflow underscore Stripe revenue recognition. So it's pretty standard that whenever you load data from a source data set into a data warehouse, that you, you know, follow the kind of like the source tool underscore the data set. Um, it's a pretty common naming convention, but maybe at your company you do it differently. Um, but this is just kind of your way of saying this is the very raw data that came from Stripe. And so because it's raw, it probably includes metadata. It probably has, you know, different naming conventions for different columns. Um, it might have things that you just don't want to send over to your end users. So it might not suffice to just send this over and say, hey, Kevin, query from this table. So let's go back to Kevin's message, and he says, throughout the month, we're going to review this data on an ad hoc basis. And by we, he's referring to the accounting team, i.e. non-data team users. And so because of that, we're actually going to transform the data and make it very readable and accessible to, to them. So we're going to do that by using a tool called DBT, which um, I'm sure everybody here is probably familiar with. And we're also going to use Cosmos to actually run DBT within Airflow. So the way that it works is, and here's like an example minified uh, file tree here, is that within the DAX folder, um, I have a DBT, an entire DBT project that you can run as you would anywhere else. And within that folder, we have a single model called you know, Stage Stripe Revenue Recognition. And it's going to do a very simple transformation that we'll see in a second. Um, and then from there, Cosmos is able to kind of see that model and create either a full DAG or a task group or just a single task that can be used within your Airflow DAG. And so here's how that model looks. So right now, this is a very simple use case. I'm just kind of coalescing two of the accounting columns that basically are the same thing. Um, but you can imagine a transformation could be uh, maybe converting the currency. Maybe something is in one currency and it's converted to the currency of your organization. Maybe the columns have a different naming convention. Um, maybe you might want to join in some data. So I think in this case, this is a view that kind of matches the original. Um, but you also might want to join it with your users table and actually show revenue per user and things of that nature. So there's many things you can do within DPT. Um, but being able to run in Airflow means that that run doesn't happen unless there's new data because you don't want to waste any resources. So as you can see here, this is the um, DPT model. And once it runs, um, it results in a uh, materialized view um, that is in the Stripe schema, and it's the revenue recognition table. And this is a cleaner table that anybody can access, not just people on the data team. And you trust that it matches all the naming conventions and all of the kind of joins um, that you want everybody to, to use. Now, Outside of running, um, Cosmos also can handle testing as well. So right now, we're going to, just going to do some very basic data tests. We want to make sure all the important columns are not null. Um, and so with that, we include that in the schema file for DPT. 
And once Cosmos reads this, it includes that test within that task group. So what you see on the right here is basically a task group that says, Cosmos, find this model, run it, um, and test it as well. And then there's this function, um, the warning callback function, which basically says, if there's a warning, um, do something with it. And in this case, we're actually going to send an alert to the data team Slack channel. And I'll actually kind of show, let me see, actually show what the function looks like here. So all I'm doing is getting uh, the tests and the results, and I'm looking at um, what was the warning message. I'm creating a Slack message um, that has the task information, execution information, the URL of it, so we can kind of click on it and figure out what's the context of that DAG run, and then we're going to send that alert to a pre-specified Slack channel that was created um, within the connections tab of, of Airflow. And what this does um, is that after it runs, it checks to see if there's warnings, and then it sends it over to Slack. Um, now, outside of that, we might want to test for additional things. So Kevin also mentioned that hopefully they're able to capture issues before um, they slip through the cracks. When the end user is thinking about data issues, they're not really thinking about data issues like we are. We're thinking about, are the foreign keys actually foreign? Um, do the, uh, do all the tables join as they need to? Are the columns there? Things of that nature. That's not what they're thinking about. They're thinking about how does this data match real life? Um, and if those expectations are different, um, what can we do to resolve those? So let's take a, a step out of data land to kind of think more on the end user. What's something that they might care about? Well, they might care about if, let's say, for a few months we didn't have any revenue or we, um, there weren't any ledger entries or just nothing really happens, nobody bought anything. Um, so that's kind of what this test is looking for. I'm using DPT expectations. And what it does is it actually checks to be sure that for every accounting period, there's at least one row. So every month something is happening. Um, and if something doesn't happen, it could be for various reasons. It could be one, maybe our DAG just messed up and that's our cue to kind of go back and figure out what happened. It could be that maybe Stripe messed up and perhaps their API was down or perhaps their API just didn't return what we expected and therefore that's our cue to kind of troubleshoot with them. Or lastly and most unfortunately, it could just be that we didn't generate any revenue for the month. And wouldn't it be great if you were able to unearth that proactively to your end user versus waiting for them to kind of look at the number on their Monday stand-up meeting um, in front of the CFO and the CEO and all of a sudden that's the first thing that they see. So detection is, yes, about kind of capturing data issues and, and, and you know, both on the data side and both the end user, um, like the business user side, but it's also about being proactive in how you kind of make sure that the data that you're bringing in matches reality. And the more that you can make sure that those two worlds connect, the more you can be seen as an actual thought partner with the business and not just some back end person who kind of sits in a back corner and codes all, codes all day. So on the bottom here, you see the Slack message that was generated because in this test case, there were some months that didn't have any data um, and it posted this alert to a Slack channel and that would have been my cue to say, what's going on with the data? Let's figure that out. And now, after we've actually ran both the, the models, um, we ran the model, we ran the test, we've um, seen if there's any like data issues that we need to address, the last thing we need to think about is reporting. So the last thing that Kevin mentioned is that revenue is very top of mind for everybody on the team and that they're going to review it every week before um, their Monday stand up. And so this is kind of a cue to say, how can we showcase that, this, that there's fresh data available to review prior to the Monday meeting? And so first, um, this function here basically is a quick check to be sure it's Monday. Um, and that this is the first DAG run of that Monday. Um, really cool, I found out that you can use the DAG run um, object to basically find all the previous DAG runs, find the last successful one, and then use that to kind of compare. Um, and then from there, we're going to use that to actually short circuit the next step. So in this example, in this project, um, there's a very simple like mini dashboard within hex that basically just shows all the revenue recognized by quarter and the total recognized revenue. And in this case, we want to rerun that report whenever um, there's new data available and send that report over to the accounting Slack channel so that way when they start their meeting, everybody's looking at the exact same data set. The one thing you don't want is people looking at old data, they say something looks wrong, and of course it looks wrong because it's from a quarter ago. You wanna be sure there's active data that people are looking at. Um, and so that's kind of what this does. It runs it and then it sends it over. 
and here's an example of how it looks within Slack. So um, once it posted, it created this uh, the Slack message with a link to the dashboard and a quick screenshot of it. So over time, you can see revenue change over time. And if anybody wants to dig in, they can click on it and go into it. Um, and so this is kind of a cool way to kind of proactively push something to your end users. And that's basically it, right? We went from data that didn't exist all the way to a report that is consumable um, and that is actionable that the business uh, users can actually use. And so the way that this flowed together was first, we extracted the data. Uh, we used the Stripe API to, to get all the data that we needed. We loaded it into our data warehouse. That, that way we can consume it. Then we um, transformed the data so that way it's usable and that way end users can actually query the data without having to worry about you know, metadata and like in, incorrect keys and, and things of that nature. And then lastly, we also reported on that data as well. And so this is a very op oversimplified project. Um, when I worked on this in real life, there was definitely more steps to it. But I hope that this shows that it really doesn't take a lot to kind of capture entirely what the business is looking for. The trick is you just have to go beyond bringing in the data and making it available. Sometimes you have to put yourself in the seat of who's going to be consuming it and say, what do they care about and how can our DAG actually support that? And in this case, I used Hex, but you can use Metabase. I use DBT, but you can use cron jobs and SQL transformations. Um, all of it is definitely up in the air, but what's important is that each part of this DAG directly correlates to something that the business actually cares about. And so when you're thinking about actually um, investing more into your airflow project, when you're thinking about saying we need to invest more in the data warehouse or invest more in taking time to build out more testing and things of that nature, you can go back and say we need to do this because the business cares about this. It's much easier to actually make that claim and push for that when you can tie it to, at the end of the day, what the business um, actually needs. And this kind of goes into three key traits of a data product that I like to think about. Number one, is it accurate? And by accurate, I mean, can we actually trust the data? Um, I'm sure some people here have actually worked on a data project where nobody would trust it, and because nobody trusted it, nobody used it. So all their hard work kind of went to nothing. And so if you actually built uh, data products that people can trust, meaning that when they get the report, when they look at the numbers, um, they believe it to be true, right? It, it's a weird anom anomaly if uh, the data isn't true. Once you can kind of get that type of trust with your end users, um, it just makes that data product much stronger. Secondly, um, is that data product proactive, right? You don't want to be somebody who gets pinged at three in the morning or after the fact because um, the data was wrong and it's been wrong for a week and you kind of have to play catch up in order to fix it. Wouldn't it be better if you were a thought partner with the business and whenever something went wrong, you were the first one to point it out? Um, that kind of makes or breaks what I found in all of my mentors and just people that I've watched from afar, that makes or breaks kind of um, going from like a junior or mid-level role into like a more senior role in your data career is that are you actually able to communicate and showcase things that everybody else would think about, not just is your code written the best or are you using the most up-to-date tools? Because at the end of the day, if their data project isn't actionable, if it, has, if it isn't usable, um, then all the work that you've done, really, um, it really just doesn't matter. Um, you can have the most beautiful DAG, but at the end of the day, if nobody uses it, nobody trusts it, then it's just code kind of written in the universe. And so that is my presentation. Um, if there are any questions, please let me know. And if you want to get the full repo for this project, you can scan here. <laughs>